It's hotter than a Christian McCaffrey spicy wife trade. This is the worst. <laughs> See, welcome into the worst fantasy show. I am your host with the least, Jack Lusne. I am going to be on vacation this weekend. I'm going to be in Hawkesbury, Ontario, uh, visiting with the fam jam. So I will not be live, but here is a video in my presence for you guys to all enjoy. And it is hot as the devil's dickens out here. So we are feeling some kind of way in this heat. We are feeling spiteful. We are feeling hateful. And so I am here to let you know all the players that I hate to draft. The ninth annual international player haters ball. Oh man. Hey, 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 hey. So the way that I'm gonna do this, I've set it up. I'll show you here. I've got my lovely little draft board. This is a fully automatic draft board. So this is on Sleeper. Shout out to Fantasy Football Universe, the boys over there. Um, they uh, basically uh, have some ongoing leagues. They still have space in all of the leagues. There's a best ball, an auction, a redraft, and I think the other one's an eliminator. Uh, so you can go. Uh, at FF Universe and join up to one of those listener leagues. I am in the best ball and auction leagues, which are almost full up. So uh, please go check that out. Uh, but basically, they have a, in the best, like I said, they have the best ball thing set up. It's a 12 team uh, PPR. So I thought that was perfect for me to uh, set up a little drafty board for myself. Uh, so again, I, this is fully automatic. I did that for a reason. I want to conceptualize ADP as a draft board. So mock drafts are great because you get to see what everybody is doing. I like to sometimes just throw up an automatic mock like this for myself, because this is basically just the ADP laid out by the computer in a draft format. And so it's it's not that much different from what the actual ADP of these guys is listed as. And I do have, <coughs> excuse me, right here next to me on my phone, you can't see it, but I have the rankings as well for the 2024 NFL season on underdog best ball, just to kind of match it up. Uh, but they're pretty similar, just giving a, a glance down at what I've got going on for the best ball rankings and what I've got going on in this actual uh, draft board. And so I wanted to just go through, I don't know if we're going to go through the entire draft. We'll see how much time we actually have for the episode, but I wanted to at least go through uh, the first 10 rounds with you guys and basically just uh, highlight all the players that I hate to draft. And so we will start it off with uh, in the first round at the 104 here, Justin Jefferson. Hate is a very exciting emotion. Haven't you noticed? Very exciting. So Justin Jefferson here at the 104. And the reason that I hate Justin Jefferson here is, uh, and the reason that I'll be hating most of these guys is simply cost versus performance. It's the average draft position, what I have to pay for them versus what I expect their performance to be. And Justin Jefferson with Sam Darnold, a retread journeyman quarterback at this point, or a rookie in J.J. McCarthy, his ceiling is just simply capped. Uh, I don't envision any scenario where he approaches 
a season a la Tyreek Hill or CD Lamb from last season. I think at his absolute peak and best, assuming he stays healthy all year, if you get a monster 1500 yard season with like a low touchdown count of like seven to eight, I think that would be honestly really outperforming what I'm expecting him to have as a season. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that again, at the one Oh four, you're basically saying he has to have that season for you to be happy with that draft price that you paid, especially again in this context and version of the draft board, Jefferson Jefferson ahead of Amon Ross St. Brown, Jamar Chase and AJ Brown. There's just no way I would take all three of those wide receivers easily ahead of Justin Jefferson. I would also take Bijan Robinson and Brees Hall comfortably ahead of Justin Jefferson, where you can start to talk me into it is Puka Nakua. Like even Jameer Gibbs, honestly, I prefer to Justin Jefferson. And I know this is kind of a little bit of a hot take, but I would prefer Saquon Barkley, quite frankly, even to Justin Jefferson. Uh, again, I just feel like I'm projecting Justin Jefferson for more of a moderate season this year. And I think that's going to be about like maybe 11 to 1200 yards and like seven touchdowns, which will look good on paper given, you know, the quarterback room. But if you pay an extreme draft price at the one Oh four now, granted he's a little bit lower on best ball uh, on underdog best ball right now, but it isn't that much lower. He is currently ranked at the 5.5 ADP, which is ahead still of Amon Ross St. Brown and AJ Brown, which again, I just, I wildly disagree with the, the, that, that take, I would take AJ Brown and Amon Ross St. Brown comfortably ahead of Justin Jefferson this season. This is not a dynasty take. This is a redraft best ball episode. So this is very much for this season. Uh, Amon Ross St. Brown, especially with like 12 dome games, the same team coming back. He is the main fixture in that passing offense. One of the most consistent wide receivers that you can draft. Uh, I would much rather have him. And, you know, again, I would much rather have AJ Brown. I know it tailed off for AJ Brown towards the end of the year, but AJ Brown, what you view as, a bad season for A.J. Brown last year was 1,486 yards and six touchdowns. To me, that would be a peak for Justin Jefferson this year. Like, if Justin Jefferson has, let me read this off to you, 159 targets, 105 receptions for 400, uh, 1,486 yards and six touchdowns, I think that would be an incredible season uh, with a patchwork of Sam Darnold and uh JJ McCarthy guess what that's what it that's what AJ Brown did last year he had 106 14 56 and 7 yeah so um i i just you know with the with the offenses uh built in and especially again i think you know as, if you're viewing that they're not going to be able to do the tush push as much uh as much in Philadelphia like you know, some of that maybe goes to AJ Brown in the passing game, and maybe he gets double digit touchdowns this year. He's very capable of that. So I, I think AJ Brown uh, and Amon Ross St. Brown, both of those guys, I have comfortably ahead of Justin Jefferson. Now, if Jefferson slips past that, which he I, he does in a lot of smart rooms, uh, like when I've been drafting with like fantasy analysts, I do see Justin Jefferson actually going as far as like, you know, one, he can go as far as like uh, 111, 112, and I would consider him in this range. I There's still guys I actually actively prefer this year, but I'm just really out on Justin the Justin Jefferson experience this year. As much as he is a fantastic wide receiver, this is just something we've seen time and time again. You know, Larry Fitzgerald, Hall of Fame wide receiver, was capped in the John Skelton years until he got Kurt Warner again. Um, so until they get like a really competent quarterback I'm comfortable with, I, I, I just don't see the point in taking the risk on Justin Jefferson as compared to 
Amon Ross St. Brown, again, one of the most consistent wide receivers in all of fantasy. Wide receivers are going to be a theme in this one um, because we'll go down from Justin Jefferson. So, you know, I'm not going to talk about the guys I love. We're only talking about the guys I hate. Because this is just pure hate on this one. This is the worst fantasy show for a reason. Y'all, uh, I'm a pessimistic person by nature. We're here to be spiteful. These are all the draft picks that I hate. And so we will get down to Garrett Wilson. This one is this one's a little bit more like minor, though. I feel like this is like just some minor hate. And it isn't even Garrett Wilson's fault. I just am not truly a believer in Aaron Rodgers. So, you know, I I have taken Garrett Wilson sometimes. I feel like I'm every time I do, though, it's like Robitussin. Like, I feel like I'm forcing myself to take Garrett Wilson because of the incredible talent and the off chance that Aaron Rodgers actually makes it through the entire season. But I just don't believe that that happens. I don't like Marvin Harrison Jr. in this range because – he would have to have a historic rookie season to outproduce the ADP. But I also don't really like Drake London in this range either because I think that's a bit of a wild card and people are just assuming that he's going to have a monster season with Kirk Cousins. I think it's possible. He does have a really big body. I think it's he's got the potential. But the problem is at 204, uh, and, you know, again, at 14.8 ADP on uh, underdog best ball, you are drafting at the ceiling. You know, this is this is about, I feel like, where Drake London was going last year. I feel like he didn't really get dinged for not meeting expectations last year because it was all blamed on Arthur Smith and Desmond Ritter. And now if it doesn't work this year, next year you'll see, I feel like, a, a much bigger discount. I, in the second round, it's just, again, of, ahead of Travis Etienne, I would much rather have Travis Etienne. I would still take the risk on Kyron Williams there. Uh, you could talk me in. I I feel like Devont, Devontae Adams could just as easily have the same finish as Drake London. Um, and I feel like people are really out on Devontae Adams. And I, I'm... Just this whole range of wide receivers I'm generally out on. I feel like the second and early third round of wide receivers overall, I just hate everyone. I hate you. I hate you. I don't even know you, and I hate your guts. I hope all the bad things in life happen to you and nobody else but you. This this is why I've really been in on, especially in best ball, on underdog tapping running backs early in this range because I I love all of these running backs in a sense. Like when I look at Jameer Gibbs, okay, huge pass catching upside and a locked in role in the Detroit offense. Saquon Barkley, I think, is being overrated, hugely uh or not overrated, sorry, hugely overlooked in a sense. Um, you look at what he did last season with an absolute garbage, garbage team in New York. He had 247 carries for 962 yards and six touchdowns. And he had 41 receptions for 280 yards and four touchdowns. The year before that, 295 for 1,300 uh, yards on the ground and 10 touchdowns. This is not just a good, this is a great, this is a, you know, former uh, considered to be like 101 breed of running back. And he's still relatively young. Like Saquon Barkley is like what, like 26 years old or something like that. So, you know, I think Saquon is just being, you know, and again, when I say he's being overlooked, he's going at the two one, but I feel like, he is a first round running back. I think the landing spot with Philly is fantastic. I would I would take him ahead of Garrett Wilson, Marvin Harrison Jr., Drake London, Devontae Adams, Chris Olave. So I think in that sense he's ranged appropriately, but I've often seen him slip, uh, especially in the best ball drafts, where people I feel like in the best ball drafts, especially 
you know, this is going off of the ADP strictly by the computer. A lot of times I'm in these draft rooms and I'm seeing, you know, the Garrett Wilson, Marvin Harrison double top or Garrett. It's the, you know, one of these three wide receivers, Drake London, Marvin Harrison, Garrett Wilson. I feel like they often end up double tapped here. Um, I'm seeing Chris Olave pushed up boards in basketball draft. Same thing with Brandon Ayuk and Nico Collins. Their ADP is pushed up a little bit. Um, and they're being taken ahead of even, you know, your Kyron Williams and your Derrick Henry. Der I've seen Kyron Williams at times starting to slip to the third round, which is absolutely insane to me. So that whole range of wide receivers, um, you know, I've been very vocal about, I feel like the running back value in this range is much better than the wide receivers. Because that's the other thing, the disparity theory that I've presented is that these running backs that you're drafting here, uh, especially you look at Bajan Robinson and Brees Hall have the potential to break fantasy and at least approach Christian McCaffrey numbers. Jameer Gibbs is like the next closest thing. Unfortunately, in a timeshare, his ceiling is a little bit more capped. Saquon, Saquon, if he has a monster enough year, could actually get close to that upper elite range of breaking fantasy. Kyron Williams, we've already seen he's able to do it if he's on the field. Uh, I think Travis Etienne is an excellent running back. And the the how far away they perform from the mean of their position, so the average of their position is greater. It's much greater by usually by 20 to 40 fantasy points on average. It's greater than the wide receivers. So, you know, by comparison, it's also they're scoring just generally more fantasy points than the wide receiver. So just as an example, like if you're running back in this range scores 260 fantasy points and the wide receiver scores 260 fantasy points, while the average wide receiver, you know, is still within like usually like 70 ish max, a hundred fans with the running backs. It's, it falls off a cliff. Uh, some of the running backs uh, in the the mean, it's like can be anywhere from 100 to 150, and then it can drop completely after that to where guys underneath the average are so far under the average that if you tried waiting super late to get those guys and you just picked a bunch of jabronis that got like 50 to 70 points, well, now you gave up a gap of legitimately like, 200 to 300 fantasy points and so that's where there's a huge disparity in between the top performing and the lowest performing running backs compared to the top performing and lowest performing wide receivers and then you have the fact that all of these receivers especially in best ball kind of seem to keep getting jammed up where they get pushed up the board and i feel like the value on the running backs is much better but Let's get into a running back that I was really hot to trot on and I've kind of cooled on, and that's Josh Jacobs. Art Barkian, Abacanesia who? I hate you! I would be Benson who? I hate you. Hate, hate, hate. Hate, hate, hate. Double hate. Loathe entirely. So Josh Jacobs originally, I thought, was an excellent addition to this team. You know, and I know he's had his struggles leaving Las Vegas because they couldn't come to terms on the contract and he showed up to training camp looking like Fat Thor and really struggled all year. And also was just coming off a year where he had uh, almost 400 touches and historically running backs coming off a year that they had 400 touches. It's usually not good. In fact, it's the reason that I actually traded Josh Jacobs, uh, ironically enough, uh, at, coming off his best year ever in Dynasty. I had traded him uh, for him the year before. I traded him away so that I could get Tyreek Hill uh, and really load up my wide receivers to a ridiculous proportion because I already had Justin Jefferson and Amon Ross St. Brown, uh, and I added Tyree Kill to that mix, which just made it completely unfair. Um, but also because I saw the potential drop-off, even if he signed the contract for Josh Jacobs, and I was really in a 
playing in a one year window of like, I'm trying to win a championship this year. And I'm still in that mode this year. Um, Cause this is a very top heavy team that I'm talking about though. I really did better this year at attacking uh, the late rookie draft and uh, rookie waiver. So I actually have kind of some decent pieces on the roster, but that's neither here nor there. The point that I am making is that, you know, coming to a new team, uh, going through the training camp and everything and having the contract and essentially replacing Aaron Jones. I, I kind of thought this was a good landing spot for Josh Jacobs. The problem is kind of just all of the talk coming out of camp really scares me uh, from LaFleur um, talking about how this is a committee backfield kind of no matter what, that Marshawn Lloyd and even A.J. Dillon, much to our chagrin, will be involved. Uh, And Josh Jacobs, not he's not necessarily an efficiency guy. Like when he gets the the 400 touches and is in shape and has a really good season, like he can have a monster fantasy season. He is better than... I think he's um, underrated a little bit in the passing game. I think he's pretty good in the passing game, actually. But if they truly split it three ways, and also the fact that they have so many weapons in the in the receiving game, whether you want to talk about the wide receivers or the way that they split the tight ends with Musgrave and Tucker Craft, it really scares me, Josh Jacobs, uh, at this ADP of... 3.7 because I just see other characters after Josh Jacobs that I think, you know, can finish ahead of him and have a lower ADP. So I'm looking at specifically, you know, Joe Mixon going at 410 and uh, James Cook going at 49. I think those are two running backs that could definitely finish ahead of Josh Jacobs and you get them around later. Uh, Isaiah Pacheco, I think you could make the argument he finishes ahead of Josh Jacobs. Um, You know, so. And then, you know, Jacobs, too, I feel like if if it is truly going to be in a timeshare with Marshawn Lloyd and we actually see that sniffing out and A.J. Dillon also, if we see that start to sniff out, that's really that's going to be tough to deal with in terms of a fantasy output for Josh Jacobs in terms of being able to reach a ceiling and outperforming the ADP. So I just think, I feel like at three, seven though, it's a, it's kind of appropriate. I feel like he could finish right there as like the RB 10, but I, I'm I don't know if he's going to be able to really get the the work to be able to climb up into the RB5. That remains to be seen. Um, but we can move it along here. Uh, Stephon Diggs. I'm fine with Stephon Diggs. I know a lot of people are out on that, but I'm more in on it. Uh, Jalen Hurts, DJ Moore, Patrick Mahomes, Malik Neighbors. Neighbors at 312 really bothers me because I know he's the only – true weapon in town i do think he can have a really nice rookie season i don't know that you're going to benefit from it especially in the beginning of the year the way that you might hope and expect just given like you know it seems like daniel jones is already having struggles in uh in training camp returning from his injury and the potential replacement is drew lock it's like this is a pro the problem with this is like Malik neighbors could see 150 targets, but like only 70 of them might be catchable targets is kind of the problem. So he really scares me a lot uh, at that ADP uh, Rashad white and just the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in general. I think they could potentially see some regression this year with the coaching change that makes me nervous. So it's not that I hate them, but I just haven't been super in on that. This range of tight ends, I'm super in on the tight ends here. Um, I really like McBride, obviously. Like, uh, Laporte is really early. I've started to come around a little bit more to it, but it's just, it's so early that I just, I, I really can't 
usually bring myself to take Laporta at 210 when I can get McBride two rounds later. And I think they'll finish, you know, pretty close to each other. Like I, if Laporta finishes one, I could see McBride finishing two. I could see that flipping either way. I could see them being within 10 points of each other. So I, I struggle to take Laporta that high when I know I can get McBride, uh, even Dalton Kincaid or Kyle Pitts in this range, even George Kittle, I think being underrated and overlooked a little bit. Uh, his connection with Brock Purdy is really solid. So uh, I like him in, in this range as well. What I don't like, and we'll get, uh, you know, we'll pack a couple guys in here and then we'll take a short little break. Um, Zay Flowers, the splits with Mark Andrews, it's been recorded. They are really, really bad. And I'm just very afraid of Zay Flowers at this ADP. Um, like again, going next to Tank Dell, I would rather take the shot on Tank Dell. I would rather take the old reliable Alvin Kamara. I would rather take one of these elite tight end options. I prefer George Pickens. I I hate T. Higgins. That's one that I really hate. Let's let's run a hate for that. I hate you. I hate you. I don't even know you, and I hate your guts. I hope all the bad things in life happen to you and nobody else but you. That, that one I had to double up on the drop. Um, but, yeah, so Zay Flowers in that range just really scares me um, because, again, there's other receivers I like, uh, George Pickens and Amari Cooper, but I love the tight ends. Like, I would much rather have Dalton Kincaid or George Kittle or Kyle Pitts and what they could potentially represent for me at the onesie position as compared to Zay Flowers or even Tank Dell in that range, to be honest. I'm not a huge on Tank Dell. I know other people are really into that. Um, you know, going back a little bit, and I kind of skipped over it, CJ Stroud in this range, I'm I'm not in on it. Uh, you know, Mahomes has shown, yeah, he can drop uh, 40, 50 touchdowns. And when you add Hollywood and potentially Xavier Worthy's speed to that offense, I can envision him going back to 40 touchdowns. With C.J. Stroud, he has three amazing wide receivers. Dalton Schultz uh, is kind of a middling tight end. I don't view Joe Mixon as like a huge receiving option out of the back. He's capable, though. So I, I like Stroud, but I'm not projecting Stroud. I've seen people go crazy and be like, oh, Stroud's going to potentially have 40, 50 touchdowns also. I, I'm i struggling to get there. I have him at like 35, which would be really good. So I don't it, – it just scares me at this range at 4-6 because, again, with quarterbacks, a lot of times the finish is really not as far as you think between, like, the quarterback 5 and the quarterback 8. It's like 20 to 30 fantasy points, really. Um, so you look at just a, uh, talking about a discount. Jared Goff, amazing opening schedule, like, for the first four weeks of the regular season. Has, like, 12 to 13 dome games. His team is ascending. He's locked in. His offensive line is ascending. Everything on this team is pointed in the right direction. Uh, receiving weapons falling out of the wazoo, and he's going in the 10th round, you know. Tua, same thing. Uh, Tyreek, uh, Tyreek is an absolute freak. You got uh, Jalen Waddle. You have potentially Malik Washington in the slot. You have those. All of those running backs are capable in the receiving game, whether it's uh, A. Shane or Raheem Mostert or Jalen Wright, and even Jonathan Smith is like a sneaky option out of the tight end slot. Like this whole team is just loaded, loaded. So, you know, and getting these guys in the 10th round, I just feel like it's silly. Justin Herbert at 10-10, it's silly. Um, Kyler Murray even at 6-11, such a value. So, so it, I really struggle taking the, the early C.J. Stroud pick. So I don't hate him. It's just not something that I'm into. Uh, but, you know, we were talking about Zay Flowers. And the other guy in this range that I've really struggled with is Kenneth Walker. Uh, you know, they have this new fit offense, which is supposed to be more of a passing offense, not really Kenneth Walker's game. Uh, it actually kind of fits more of Zach Charbonnet's game. And I am I have been taking late shots on Zach Charbonnet because I think, you know, with the new coaching staff, 
and the way things are set up, it would not shock me at all that if Charbonnet takes over the job by the end of the year. And because of that, it scares me to death to take Kenneth Walker in the fifth round, again, ahead of like Alvin Kamara, who I, there's no way Alvin Kamara loses his job. Kendra Miller, you know, we've already seen Dennis Allen come and put his stupid foot in his stupid mouth uh, and talk about how Kendra Miller can't stay healthy and, you know, we need guys to stay out of the training room or whatever he said. Um, and Jamal Williams was completely busted last season, and I don't envision him taking away a lot of work. So Alvin Kamara, by default, uh, and on the dump-offs, like, there's no way, no way I would take Kenneth Walker ahead of him. And then again, when I look at the tight ends in the range, when I look at George Pickens and Amari Cooper there, like, this is where, I again, I am very happy to have taken my running backs early because I can load up on the tight end I want or, you know, like I said, um, load up on uh, uh, on my late wide receiver values that I like, like George Pickens and Amari Cooper. I'm not in on Keenan Allen either. That's just because, again, I struggle to see how Caleb Williams is going to support three all-star wide receivers, and they're all going, you know, in the first seven rounds, basically, with DJ Moore, Keenan Allen, and Roma Dunes. I think if there was one I was taking, it would be DJ Moore, especially signed a huge contract, and he has just like the huge spike week ability. But I think Keenan Allen might end up being kind of the most consistent, but without the ceiling. And then Roma Dunes, I think, gets relegated to like an unfortunate JSN role where he'll have weeks that are usable and in a best ball format. I would be fine with it if he was going much later, but at that 6-9 spot, you're still getting really critical parts of your team. So it's just uh, not something that I've really been into. Uh, but I said that after Zay Flowers and Kenneth Walker, we would take a short break. So we will be right back after this 30-second dance party. 30-second yeah. dance party. All right, um, so getting kind of into the thick of things in these middle rounds here, we kind of talked about T. Higgins. My my hate for T. Higgins is well known. Let the hate flow through you. <laughs> uh, I just historically have always been out on T. Higgins. Anytime he climbs up into this range of wide receiver, Again, you are betting on him essentially finishing with 1,208 uh, 1200 yards and eight touchdowns, which to me is like a perfect season in that wide receiver two role for the Cincinnati Bengals, meaning like Joe Burrow stays healthy the entire season. They are a winning team with a middling defense. And also, you know, Jamar Chase isn't soaking up like, to uh, a 2000 yard season, you really need kind of a lot of ifs to go right. I feel like for T Higgins to max out on his ADP compared to Amari Cooper just does, does it year after year. Um, like I just would much rather have Amari Cooper again. I keep reiterating in this range, like uh, usually I've already gone running back, running back, uh, wide receiver, wide receiver, or some variation of, like usually by my uh, in my first four picks, I've taken some kind of four pack of wide receiver and running back, but I usually have taken two running backs at that point. Um, and the reason being, because then by the time I get to this middling rounds, oh, okay, let me grab like a you know maybe a, a second or third wide receiver, and let me get you know one of these elite tight ends or one of these quarterbacks that I like, uh, especially like Kyler Murray's been one that I really like. Um, so that's just kind of been my strategy, but moving along, um, you know, I, 
there's really nobody I hate until we get to DeAndre Swift. I hate DeAndre Swift almost as much as DeAndre Swift hated the tush push last year because it felt like he went down at the one yard line so many times that ended up they just would tag him out and then it would end up being the Jalen Hurts tush push. And it was infuriating, which is funny because, you know, it's another reason I'm so in on Saquon and, you know, not to cast aspersions, but. You know, Saquon a much better tackle breaker. That's kind of my problem with this. DeAndre Swift is not like a great tackle breaker. What I liked about him going to Philadelphia and why I was in on him in Philadelphia is because he needs the the running lanes to kind of be opened up for him, and then his athleticism and burst can just kind of take over. But he will go down on contact for the most part. And now that he is in Chicago. I don't see their off like I think their offensive line is okay. I don't see it as like a top ten unit. Um, I I think it's it's improving, but it is still not where it needs to be necessarily. And now you're going to be uh, having a rookie quarterback under center. You have these three kind of big personality wide receivers that need attention down the field. Not to mention Cole Komet. and then also you have kind of a three headed monster in this backfield because Khalil Herbert is a very capable running back. And I think Roshan Johnson also presents uh, as a capable running back and part of this kind of three-headed monster. And DeAndre Swift, historically, before being in Philadelphia, always also struggled with injuries. Um, And, you know, Chicago being a cold, the Windy City, kind of that cold, windy city, they make me a little bit nervous for DeAndre Swift and this running game and how he really fits into it. It almost kind of reminds me of like a Miles Sanders situation, though it is a more talented team than the Panthers. It's again, it's a the rookie quarterback and you're thinking that they're going to lean on the running backs more. And it kind of ends up not turning out that way because they have like a veteran wide receiver presence that they need to pay attention to. And, you know, instead of Adam Thielen, it's Keenan Allen. But then you also add in, like I said, DJ Moore and Roma Dunes. Uh, there's a lot of mouths to feed in this offense. And I think DeAndre Swift might end up being the one uh, kind of looking, you know, on uh, he's going to be on uh, the outside looking in. And I look at some of the running backs going immediately after him and David Montgomery and Zamir White and even Najee Harris and Tony Pollard. I would I would rather have all of those players ahead of DeAndre Swift at ADP. And the next guy on the list that I really I just I I can't stand him. Go fuck yourself. It's Zach Moss. Zach Moss to me, and I know that he's a value at least at 7-9, but Zach Moss to me is this year's Alexander Madison. You look at kind of a perennial backup who suddenly finds himself with a starter job on a pretty good offense, and everyone's just kind of expecting him to have that lead role and return on value, and He could have that lead role all year and ultimately be not that relevant for fantasy, especially if they end up kind of throwing the ball in hyperdrive like, you know, 600 times and they're using him, you know, more as a pass blocker because he the thing about Zach Moss is he did excel in pass blocking. So if they're using him as a more of a pass blocker, now he might make up for it depending how heavily he gets used in the receiving game out of the backfield, that could potentially be a nice role for him, especially if he's got the lead back. So there is, I do see a potential path, but it scares the hell out of me. And for the most part, I've really hated, uh, you know, taking Zach Moss. And it's kind of the same thing with like Austin Eckler and Jonathan Brooks in this range. I look at these guys and I'm just like, yeah, you're, you know, Eckler sharing with Brian Robinson, who's going around later. 
kind of, I feel like, negates both of them and their ceiling. You know, Jonathan Brooks, not going to be available for the beginning of the season. And then when he is going to be available, like, he's still going to be playing for the Carolina Panthers, you guys. Like, the, the running back last year really struggled for that team. Um, so I don't – even though Jonathan Brooks is talented, I, I wonder how effective he's going to be in his first rookie season with a, a ultimately a bad team, especially when he's not going to be there for training camp and he's not going to be there – for the preseason and he's really probably not going to be there for the first part of the regular season. So at this ADP again, at a four ahead of Raheem Mostert ahead of Javante Williams, who's now second year removed from the injury. No fucking way. Like I just, that's why I hate the pick again. I, I always look at ADP. I look at the guys going around. I'm like, Jake Ferguson's one of my favorite tight end targets this year. Uh, Brian Thomas jr. In a best ball format has huge spike week potential. These guys are going after Jonathan Brooks. Like, there's, it's nonsensical to me. Uh, well, we're getting into the ninth round. You know what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually – we've got 9 to 15 here. Let's just go quick fire for the rest of the episode. Still waiting on that heifer, Julio. <laughs> fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. You're cool. And fuck you. I'm out. All right, so at this point, every guy pet in double digit rounds is you know you you take your chance on him if you really believe in him. It doesn't really matter what I say because at that point they're all values, and if they end up on waivers, it's not really going to hurt your team. So the guys that I generally hate in the range of we'll go from like nine to twelve, let's say we we won't go all the way to fifteen. So Jalen Warren at 9-2, I can tell you I'm out on that. Um, Pittsburgh Steelers fan through and through. I love Jalen Warren for our team. He will have an auxiliary role in this offense. However, Arthur Smith historically has always run the highest percentage of two tight end sets in the NFL. These are primarily single back sets, power running back sets. They are built for a running back like Najee Harris. The reason Najee struggled so much last season was because in the beginning of the year, they were running a lot of their stuff out of shotgun formation. That's why Jalen Warren suddenly looked so much better than Najee Harris is because they were running out of shotgun, which is really good for Jalen Warren. They're not going to be doing as much of that this season. So I would expect Jalen Warren's role to be relegated and you're going to be disappointed at that 9-2 ADP, especially ahead of a guy like Devin Singletary, who has the role to himself. Zeke, gross as it is, probably going to end up being the primary Cowboys running back. Um, you know, a bounce back candidate in like JSN or Christian Watson. The, the quarterbacks, I love the quarterbacks in this range, and it's why I'm generally waiting on quarterback. Um, but again, getting back to the guys that we hate, Gotta hate some guys here. Oh, Dallas Goddard. Ooh, ooh, I fucking hate Dallas Goddard. <laughs> Dallas Goddard's the most mid fucking player that's ever existed and gets overdrafted every single year. I I don't even like Cole Komet. I would take Cole Komet. I would take Schultz. I would take Musk. Every single tight end pretty much after Dallas Goddard. Like, Dallas Goddard just is... In his entire career, I don't. He's never passed sixty receptions. He's never passed uh, like eight hundred and fifty yards. He's never had nine hundred. He's never touched it, and he's never had more than uh, six touchdowns in an entire season. Like he is just spectacularly mid, and he always, always gets hurt. Fuck, I hate me some fucking Dallas Goddard. Oh my god. Go fuck yourself. Uh, so Dallas Goddard, uh, Ty J Spears, not it on Mr. Snap Percentage Spears. Uh, that was one of my big things last year. Everyone was like, oh, but oh, it's like he's got the snap percentage. He's gonna he's gonna take the job from Derrick Henry. And I watched this man go out and get nine carries for eight yards. Yo, miss me with that. Um Jamison Williams, uh, I'll believe it when I see it. Adonai Mitchell. 
Uh, you know, if I'm drafting rookies, I'm wanting the guys going earlier that I see having a path to the one number one spot. Him, there's just no way that he passes Michael Pittman. So at best, you're hoping for the wide receiver too. On a team with Anthony Richardson that doesn't really pass the ball, so I don't see the point. Um, you know, Dalton Schultz just very mid. Also, Chase Brown. Uh, you get I, because I'm kind of, but I feel like Zach Moss, like. I feel like Zach Moss's presence stops Jay Brown from having the true potential that he could have, but I don't hate, I don't really hate the pick. Uh, and then kind of the last one that I really hate here is Cole Komet. I feel like is the fourth option. Now you could argue maybe the third ahead of Roma dunes, but he's definitely going to be behind DJ Moore and Keenan Allen for me in terms of uh, target share. So I just, I don't see how he is going to be able to return on potential for fantasy. Uh, and then Mike Williams, uh, even though he's going really late, Mike Williams coming off that injury. I don't know how that's really going to work out for him. Uh, but yeah, I mean, at this point, you know, I, even in the, at 11, nine, like if Mike Williams does work out, you're happy. And if he doesn't, you'll drop him by week two and you'll have moved on with your life. So it doesn't really matter. We're going to wrap it up right here, kind of keep it short and sweet this week. Uh, super appreciate you guys watching the episode. If you've made it this far, really, really helps. If you guys can super kick that subscribe button, uh, drop an elbow on those comments, especially if you guys have ideas for the shows and stuff you want to see, uh, hit me up, uh, all my socials, at Jack Lucine, uh, or you can send emails to worst sports channel at gmail.com. But until the next time, I'll catch all of you guys on the flip side. He's running down the middle by the 50. He's at the 30. He's bare-chested and banging his chest. Now he runs the opposite way. He runs at the 50. He runs at the 40. The guy is drunk, but there he goes. The 20. They're chasing him. They're not going to get him. Waving his arms, bare-chested. Somebody stop Look that out. man. Here comes